So if you don't already, please be sure to follow us. We'll jump right in. I'd now like to introduce our first guest, guest and my colleague, Dr. Michael Olasco. Dr. Olasco joined the Boston University CT Center team in 2015, where he is a lead investigator. He's authored 150 peer-reviewed studies and served as a lead author on some of the largest CTE studies ever published using data from the VA Boston University Concussion Legacy Foundation Brain Bank. Dr. Olasco is a licensed clinical neuropsychologist, an associate professor at Boston University School of Medicine, and serves as the co-director for the BU Alzheimer's Disease Research Center Clinical Core. He also sees patients clinically for the Memory and Aging Clinic at Boston University or at Boston Medical Center. Mike, welcome. Thank you for joining us. And I will turn it over to you to give us the current state of the science of CTE in football. All right. Thank you, Chris, so much for uh, for having me here. And it's uh, it's really it's really awesome to see. Finally, we have a month dedicated to to awareness for CTE. Um, and I hope that uh, we get some of uh, this important research and, and science out, out in the public to, to do exactly that, create awareness. Um, so today um, I wanna go over the state of the science with everyone on CTE. Uh, so specifically, what do we know now about CTE, specifically about the, the relationship between American football play and CTE, and then also where are we going? What do we need to know? So I'm going to cover several different topics. So first I'll start off, I'll lay kind of the, the framework of the talk. So what is chronic traumatic encephalopathy or, or CTE? And, and three, what, what do we know about the risk factors for CTE right now? And how are we doing with being able to detect and diagnose this CTE, uh, CTE during life? As, as we'll learn going through right now, we're still only able to uh, accurately detect it after someone passes away and we can examine their brain under a microscope. So where do we stand with, with picking this up in life? And then throughout this, I'm really going to kind of point to where we're going with the research. What are we doing now? What can we expect in the future? And, and I hope all of this serves as, as a call for, for action, uh, particularly from, from the science community on what we need to uh, address. What are the key knowledge gaps we need so we need to answer and questions we need to answer? So I think I'll, I'll get right into it. I, I think um, really where we are today is, is through the incredible resources of the Veteran Affairs Boston University and Concussion Legacy Foundation uh, Collaborative Brain Bank Initiative. Um, as you might have seen this year, we've reached uh, a really important milestone of having over now over a thousand brain donors. It's the largest uh, biorepository of CT tissue in the world. And it's through this resource and through um, the work at, at, at BU and the VA and through recruitment efforts from Concussion Legacy Foundation that we've been able to make a lot of strides in, in the science. And it's also resulted in a lot of awareness and, and we see institutions and, 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 and centers all across the world now uh, dedicated to studying CTE. So again, this, this, this is a major thank you to, to everyone and all the resources and all the people involved in this ongoing effort. And it's through these resources, like I said, where we've now um, have been able to establish what CTE looks like uh, in the brain. Uh, this is through the work of, of course, you know, Dr. McKee, who everyone likely has heard of and knows. Um, Dr. McKee has developed the diagnostic criteria for, for CTE. Uh, and this is what, this was a paper published in 2016 that, that was sponsored by the NINDS and IBIB um, to define the neuropathological diagnostic criteria for CTE. And it involved getting together the world's kind of leading neuropathologists and evaluating a series of slides. And what they all agreed was that CT uh, was characterized by a unique lesion. So specifically, it was characterized by the presence of tau, which is the brown here, around small blood vessels, which you see here with this white circle. And it tended to accumulate at the bottoms of the folds of the brain, as you see here on the left. So this was a lesion or, or a characteristic that is unique, unlike any other neurodegenerative disease, quite different from Alzheimer's disease. 
In fact, when we compare CTE and Alzheimer's disease, uh, where the tau presents is different. So here's a side-by-side -side comparison of the two diseases. On the left here is CTE, and you see that the tau starts to accumulate in the frontal and temporal uh, parts of the brain. Um, and then it doesn't really reach the middle part of the brain until later stages, down here in stage three. You get quite the opposite pattern of Alzheimer's disease where it really starts to accumulate more in the middle part of the brain and then hits the front and the side parts of the brain later on in the disease. So not only it, do we know that the, the tau presents differently across the two diseases, but also the, the type of tau, the molecular structure of tau is different between CT and Alzheimer's disease. And here is a, is a wonderful paper in 2019 that uh, directly show using, um, um, using advanced techniques that quant can look at the actual molecular structure of, of the tau that directly shows differences in the two diseases. So these were really quite exciting advancements. Um, and we've been learning a lot through the UNITE study on both the clinical and the pathological features of CTE. So what is the UNITE study? So as I mentioned before, we have the VABU CLF brain bank. Everyone who comes to the VABU a, BU CLF brain bank also joins the UNITE study. And the UNITE study is, 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 is shown here. There's two arms to it. So one arm uh, involves the brain undergoing a really comprehensive pathological examination. And, then, and all the neuropathologists, so that's Dr. McKee, Dr. Steen, Dr. Huber, who are part of the team, they, they are all blinded to the clinical data. As they're doing the examination of the brain, the, there's also the clinical arm. And that's the side of the arm that, that, that I'm, I'm part of. And that's where we talk to the families and we get a really detailed history of the symptoms that the individual experienced during life. And the purpose of this is all to study what CT looks like in the brain and also to understand what are the symptoms that were happening in people who have CT. So the UNITE study um, or the brain bank, like I said, it accepts donations from all individuals who have had a history of exposure to repetitive head impacts. And this is regardless of symptoms, that's not a, a, a requirement to, for donation. A majority of our brain bank, and it's actually, it, as it's grown, we're getting a lot more different types of exposures, but still a majority of the brain bank is made up of individuals who played American football. And so a lot of what we know about CT now is really based on studies of former American football players. And in part, that's because that's who's been donating, but also um, we've used this population because they're similar, similar in types of similar in terms of the types of exposures they've had to repetitive head impacts, but also how common and how frequent repetitive head And while we might not be able to make um, inferences or, or, or our ability to make inferences to other populations can be limited, it's an ideal population to study CTE. And this is in one of the, one of the you know, largest studies and, and most recognized studies from our center came out in 2017. And this was from the UNITE study. This was a case series of 202 deceased American football players who all donated their brain to the VA BUCLF brain bank. And of the 202 deceased American football players, 177 or 87% were neuropathic logically diagnosed with CT using the Dr. McKee's criteria I showed you earlier. So I wanna break this down a little bit into exactly who these individuals are. So if we look here, um, a total, the, this table shows 177 uh, deceased football players who had CT, 44 of whom had mild CTE. So CT, you have stages one through four, one and two are considered to be mild, three and four are considered to be severe. They were all men. Um, we had about 19% um, who identified as black and then the remainder were largely people who identified as white. 
age, uh, people who had severe C CT tended to be much older compared to those who had mild CT. The most common cause of death um, was neurodegenerative disease, although suicide and cardiovascular disease were also relatively high, um, and with suicide being higher among those who had uh, less severe stage disease. Now, if we look at the exposure characteristics or their, what, what, what did their athletic career look like? We see that those who had severe CT played on average almost three years longer compared to those who did not. And then we also found that 48 out of 53 who played college had CT. So that's about 91%. And then 110 out of the 111 who played in the NFL had CT. Now this number, the 110 and 111 got quite a bit of attention. And I really do feel that the 48 out of 53 who played college did not get that much attention. And that's where a majority or a much larger proportion of the population is playing football at. And that number is, in, is, in, is can be incredibly, um, is incredibly concerning. And I'm gonna break down what these numbers mean soon. Um, but it does, it is important, to, I'll say it now, that these aren't numbers based on, on prevalence. We can't estimate prevalence because, because of certain limitations associated with the brain bank. Now, I'm going to get into that in a second, but I, I do want to drive that point home. Um, in terms of position, we have the positions bro broken down here as well. You know, a majority, because, um, you know, there's many more linemen who play football, a majority, there is more linemen who are represented in the brain bank as well. So what else did this study teach us? One of the things that was really important from the study was it also taught us how the tau of CT is presenting in the brain. And this is really important for differential diagnosis for, from things like Alzheimer's disease and other types of neurodegenerative diseases. And here, like I showed you, it really starts off uh, predominantly in frontal temporal regions. And this region becomes really well effect, uh, uh, affected or severely affected as, as the stages or disease progresses. Likewise, the memory centers of the brain or the hippocampus, while not affected early on, do become uh, quite affected in, in more severe disease. So a frontal temporal kind of distribution of a pathology is being presented in this disease. Now, as I was talking about, the, the question that that study really kind of triggered for most people is, is CT common in the general population? What does this tell us about the general population? And like I said, there's, there's a lot of um, limitations around who comes into the brain bank, limitations in terms of what we can say about the general, uh, um, the general population. So as I mentioned, we had 110 out of 111 NFL players who donated their brain and had CT. This study here out in 2019 took that number and tried to estimate the prevalence of, of CT based on this data. And so this is what they did. So they took a complete list of the um, 1,142 former NFL players who died during the JAMA study timeframe. So that study that we did took place between 2008 and 2016. And they got a list of all former NFL players who died during that timeframe. And they, that list is available from the profootballreference.com. And then what they did was they took the probability that a person, a participant with and without CT donated to that brain bank, to our brain bank, or part of the JAMA study during this time frame, and they could calculate or estimate what might be the prevalence of CTE in, in former NFL players specifically. And so if you assume that during that time frame, we got all of the CT, all the CT cases came to our brain bank then our, the prevalence of CT in former NFL players would be 9.6%, right? So we got 110 former NFL players. There's a, a 1,142 total who died during that time frame gives you 9.6%. If you assume that we only got 90% of all CT cases, the prevalence is, becomes 10%, so 10.7%, right? It, go, it starts to go up once we start to um, once we start to acknowledge that we're missing cases who aren't coming to our brain bank. And so likewise, if you think we only got 50% of all CTE cases that came to the brain bank, then the prevalence in, of CTE in former NFL players would jump to 19.3%.
right? So even if you assume that we got all of the CTE cases, we're still talking about 9.6% in former NFL players. So while we still can't really know how common it is, I, I think we can say it's not likely to be rare. And we, we really also need to know these numbers in, in high school and at the college level. Those are where most people are playing the sport. And that's where we need to get a, a better a sense of how common it is. So what about the risk factors? So I really like to think of risk for CT within this framework here. And this was actually published in 2020. And we know in Alzheimer's disease and other neurodegenerative disease, it's never one thing that causes a disease. But here, we're, what we see is that one thing that's common to all people who've had CT in our, in our brain bank is that they've had this history of repetitive head impacts. So we do think that repetitive head impacts is necessary for the development of CT, but we don't think it's, not, it's necessarily sufficient, meaning that people certainly play American football or are exposed to repetitive head impacts and don't go on this path. And that's why we think other risk factors are at play um, as, as depicted here. But I do wanna focus on this pathway in the box here. What, is the, what do we know about the relationship between repetitive head impacts and CT neuropathology? So first, what are repetitive head impacts? So repetitive head impacts is anytime there's some type of force, mechanical force or uh, applied to the head that causes injury to the brain, right? And so that force is an environmental exposure. And that exposure to the head causes injury to the brain. That injury can result in symptoms. So you think about your typical concussion symptoms, physical sleep problems, trouble with mood, thinking and memory problems. Those are what we know as concussion, as mild TBI. But what we're more concerned about are those hits to the head that result in injury to the brain but perhaps, but do not result in symptoms. So these are what we refer to as sub-concussion, sub-concussions, sub-concussions. So these are the types of head impacts that we see over and over again in things like American football, but other, other, other sources, con, uh, other contact sports, physical violence, and so on. So one really important study that was done in 2015 was, was actually from um, the Mayo Clinic Neurodegenerative Disease Brain Bank. And this, this study, um, I feel, is very important because it, it, is, it does not um, have the issues associated with selection to the brain bank that we have. In other words, they're not recruiting or they're not having people come into their brain bank because they have a history of repetitive head impacts. And so their results can be a little bit more generalizable, although still, still some limitations there. So what they did is they wanted to know the presence of CT in their brain bank of neurodegenerative disorders for individuals who did and did not have a history of contact sports play. And so they went through the medical records of over 1700 men and they reviewed for evidence of TBI or participation in contact sports. And then they took the brains and they looked um, and they, and they um, stained them for CT, oh, I'm sorry. And what they found is that 21 of the 66 former amateur contact sport athletes had the tau lesion consistent with CTE. They did not find CTE in almost in the 198 people who did not have any exposure to contact sports, including the 33 individuals who had a single TBI. Right. So that was so that tells us that CTE pathology was only detected in individuals who had a history of contact sports. And that kind of supports what we've, been, what we've been thinking and showing that exposure to contact sports and repetitive head impacts as being the greatest risk factor for CTE pathology. And this study was then done in 2019 more recently to directly test and quantify the association or the strength of the association between American football play and risk for chronic traumatic encephalopathy. And so this involved, again, these were, were former uh, or American football players who were part of the UNITE study and the brain bank. There was 266, um, 43 of whom did not have CTE and then 78 had mild CTE and, and um, 145 had severe CTE. 
the mean age at death you can see was, was um, uh, greatest in those who had severe CT versus mild CT. And then if you look down here, as we've been, as we've been showing and what this study directly tested was that those who had more severe disease had more years of play and tend to play at higher levels as well. So what this study found was that the odds of CT increased by 30% for each additional year of football played. And so for each 2.6 years played, the odds of CT develop, uh, developing CT develop, uh, doubled. And same thing for severity of CT. So among those who had CT in the sample, the odds of developing severe CT increased by 14%. And what's, what's really important part of this study that's often gets overlooked is that we, we were really careful about accounting for selection. Selection meaning accounting for factors that influence people who come to the brain bank here. So people who come to our brain bank here are gonna be people who are concerned and who have symptoms and who are likely more or more likely to have CTE. And when we think about how selection or selection bias affects our results, we think about it in this type of, of um, diagram, right? So factors that influence someone's choice to donate, in order for it to affect our results, it has to affect the variables we're studying. And so here, it's very much the case that people are more likely to donate if their loved one played football for longer uh, or if they've had symptoms and therefore more likely to have CT. But we, but we did, and this was led by our biostatistician and, and, other, and other individuals, um, but even when we accounted for selection or, or selection bias, the strength of our results still held, meaning that even when we account for, for factors that would, would bias our results toward not, uh, for, for selection, we still found that the more years of playing American football were associated with increased risk for CT and the strength of that relationship still held. And that's really important point here I, I, I would wanna make. And even other places are finding a similar relationship, although, this one here is not looking at CTE pathology after at autopsy. Instead, they're looking at um, seasons of professional play and, and symptoms in living individuals. This is from uh, the football players health study. And though, so this was a survey study of all um, former players, uh, NFL players. And this included about 3,500 players who returned the survey. And what they found was a relationship between the more seasons of professional play as well as playing position corresponded to worse self-reported um, neuropsychiatric or, or thinking and mood problems. And this also consistent with that theme is we published this, this paper in 2020. Um, this was this, the goal of this paper was to look at the association between exposure to repetitive head impacts as well as traumatic brain injury to later life problems with depression and, and cognition. And so this is one of the largest study of its kind. So we leveraged the brain health registry. And so the brain health registry, you can Google it now and find it, but it's this internet based uh, platform um, where it, it asks you a bunch of um, questions of your of thinking and memory. It asks you a bunch of questions of your health history and it was designed to, to um, track and follow people concerned for having Alzheimer's disease. But there's also questions in here that, that, that ask about repetitive head impact exposure and traumatic brain injury. So we had a sample, our final sample was uh, just over 13,000 and we had various uh, bins of, of types of exposure. So you had people uh, who had repetitive head impacts from, from contact sports, as well as from military service and as well as from physical violence. And then we had another bin of people who had a traumatic brain injury that could have been a, from a car accident or from falls or other, or other sources. And we looked at the different combinations of, of injuries and exposures. And ultimately what we found here was that those people who said that they had a history of repetitive head impacts reported more symptoms of, of depression here on your left here compared to those without symptoms. And I, and, I, and I forgot to mention each one of these groups, they were all uh, 
matched on demographics. So they were demographically similar in terms of things like age, sex, and so on. So those who had repetitive head impacts more likely to report more symptoms of depression, also more likely to have worse performance on a computerized task of, think, of, of um, reaction speed or working memory. And interestingly here, if you look on the right for both, as people uh, went up, or should I say, as people had both a history of repetitive head impacts, and as they had more severe traumatic brain injury, those are the individuals who had more symptoms of depression and more trouble with, with, a, with a working memory and reaction speed task. So this was one of the largest studies to date uh, on this topic. Uh, we were really excited by, by it, uh, although there are key limitations to it, particularly that um, our assessment of repetitive head impacts exposure and traumatic brain injury is rather crude. So we just actually are, got funded um, by the NIH to build on that study um, and to launch this new study called the Head Impact and Trauma Surveillance Study, or HITS. And so this is kicking off soon. And the goal is to take the brain health registry, create a HITS module that's dedicated to assessing repetitive head impacts. And we're specifically focusing on soccer and tackle football. And here we're going to recruit um, thousands of, of football players, thousands of former soccer players, and, and we're going to follow them longitudinally through this entirely online-based platform. And we're gonna be able to assess their thinking and memory. We're, we'll assess kind of neuropsychiatric uh, symptoms. And this study will really allow us to answer some really important questions, like looking at the relationship uh, between um, tackle football and soccer and later life memory problems looking at does the age you start to play matter? How many head impacts are too many? These are the types of questions that, that, that this study is designed to, to hopefully answer. And in particular, we're hoping that it'll help us eventually kind of get to our ultimate goal of being able to diagnose CT during life. This is really the next critical next step. So as I, I mentioned at the beginning, right now we have um, neuropathological diagnostic criteria to, to diagnose CT after someone passes away. And our understanding of what this disease looks like in the brain is really becoming quite good and, and well-defined. But it still lags, our, our ability to kind of pick this up during life still lags behind a little bit. Although we have made a lot of advancements. So this was just published in 2000, 2021. So in 2014, we, there was um, the team here at the BUCT Center published initial uh, research diagnostic criteria for the clinical syndrome of CT, known as traumatic encephalopathy syndrome. These were revised uh, and published in 2021. And the goal of these criteria or this revision was um, to make the criteria more specific. In other words, the original criteria included symptoms that were very sensitive, but not specific, meaning that the symptoms listed cut across various types of other diseases and disorders. Here we aim for specificity. And so what the criteria involve is substantial exposure to repetitive head impacts. Um, there has to be a cognitive, there has to be two core, one or two core, there's two core features. There can either be cognitive impairment namely trouble in, in memory or executive function, often that needs to be substantiated by neuropsychological testing. And then, or there has to be neurobehavioral dysregulation. So this is things like uh, trouble regulating emotions, explosive behaviors, impulsivity, uh, rage. These are symptoms that we've often seen and reported and described in people who have had an autopsy confirmed CTE. And then there's also functional impairment um, that we rate, you know, does the person have dementia? Um, so does their thinking, memory, trouble with neurobehavioral dysregulation cause them to have trouble with driving, managing their finances and so on. And then there's also a list of supportive features, meaning that these aren't core features because we see them, but, but perhaps not as often as we, see, as we see things like cognitive impairment or the neurobehavioral dysregulation we see in cases of autopsy confirmed CTE. Now, I, I like to emphasize that we, we, we don't bring these into the clinic yet because we don't know how well they work. 
we're still, they're still only for research and that's why we're investigating their utility. Um, and we're still, and, and we're still learning the specific signs and symptoms. I think this is a major advancement in the criteria. And I think um, we will get more specific that these will be more specific symptoms of CT, but we're still learning about them. But like other neurodegenerative diseases, like Alzheimer's disease, the way we're gonna be able to detect and accurately diagnose CT during life is by combining a really rich clinical history and a really uh, well uh, validated battery of thinking and memory tests and then combining that with a biomarker or a marker of what's going on in the brain, something like an MRI of the brain. One of the types of imaging sequences we've been really focusing on and the field has been focusing on is something called tau PET imaging. So PET imaging allows us to specifically measure the protein of tau that we see in CT as well as in other uh, diseases like Alzheimer's disease. So we have a series of radio tracers that have been de uh, developed. Uh, these radio tracers, um, what it involves is the individual lays um, in the scanner. They, they're injected with the tracer through the forearm. The tracer, you wait a period of time, the tracer will travel up to the brain and it's designed to seek out and target and bind to things like tau. And then through the scanner, you can take images of that tracer binding to, to the, the target protein, in this case, tau. And so a lot of these tracers were developed specifically to detect Alzheimer's disease. And the one that's in fact FDA approved to do this now is flirtausapir. Uh, specifically flirtausapir was approved by the FDA to detect the tau that we see in, in patients with cognitive impairment due to Alzheimer's disease and not necessarily CTE. But we have studied flirtausapir in CTE, and I'm going to go over some of those findings with you now. So here was a study published in 2019 by uh, Dr. Stern, who's here at the BU CTE Center. And so this involved 26 symptomatic former NFL players and also 31 same age men who did not have symptoms, um, and, they did, and they did not also have a history of uh, traumatic brain injury. And so what this study showed was that the former NFL players had higher levels of flortausapir compared to the controls in the superior frontal and the medial temporal uh, parts of the brain. So regions that you would expect based on what we know of the pathology of CT and here there it's imaged here on your left. We also, they also found that the more years of playing football correlated with higher levels of flortausapir in the brain. None of the former NFL players had uh, evidence, or I should say 25 of the 26 former NFL players did not have a positive uh, amyloid test or PET scan. And there was no association with clinical function. So we don't, the, the clinical meaning of this elevation here in the former NFL players is unclear. And the effect sizes in the comparison to, between the groups was also small meaning that overall, while we found group differences, at the individual level, there was some overlap between the two groups. Dr. Rabinovich over at the University of California, San Francisco group has also investigated flortausapir in people at risk for CTE. And so these involved um, 11 men who had uh, met criteria for the 2004 TES research criteria, 10 of them being former uh, American football players. Then he also compared them to individuals who had Alzheimer's disease, uh, and then also individuals who had, um, they were amyloid negative uh, controls. And so what you can see here on your right, the scatter plots are perhaps the most, most useful here, is that all of the, the black circles here are the individuals who were at risk for CTE. And you can see that they were all quite comparable in terms of their level of flirtausapir in the brain, to um, the controls, and that the Alzheimer's disease um, subjects had much higher levels. And this was for the frontal lobe, as well as for the medial temporal lobe. So again, like the study by Dr. Stern that I just showed you, it's still, um, we're still seeing a pattern in the brain that's consistent with what we might see uh, at, at autopsy, but there's a lot of overlap and small effect sizes between the former um, individuals, uh, football players, and the controls. So a little bit un unexpected. 
Um, and in fact, Arthur Rabinovich also looked at a, did another study in 2020 where he, he compared um, flortausapir in the brain uh, during life to tau levels uh, at, at death. And so this is one of the gold standard uh, studies to really validate a biomarker. When you can take a measurement that was done in, during life and correlate it with what we see in the brain um, at, at, at autopsy. And so this was a white uh, male former NFL player who had 17 years of play and died at 72. He had a PET scan 52 months prior to death. Um, and what that PET scan showed was um, for tau superior or tau uptake in frontal and temporal regions of the brain. But what they found was that it, this individual also had CT stage four at death. But what they found was a modest effect size between tau superior on PET and tau at autopsy, and it was a non-significant. So in this individual, you would have hoped to see a much stronger relationship if this was a biomarker that will allow for, for accurate and early detection. So I think kind of taking these three studies overall, the general consensus right now is that for tau superior PET perhaps it could pick up on late stages of CTE disease, but its ability to capture these early stages uh, where, where that's the optimal window for therapeutic intervention might be limited. And so we're actually doing a study now, myself and Dr. Rabinovich, uh, Chris, uh, Dr. Nowinski and Concussion Legacy Foundation are also leading recruitment. We're looking at another PET tracer called MK6240. This is a second generation tracer, meaning it was developed to have slightly better uh, or better imaging properties. And our thought is that this might do a better job of finding the CTE tau. So we're recruiting former National Football League players. Um, this study has been going on for about a year now. Um, we're still in active recruitment phase. Um, it, we're recruiting people between 45 and 74, 74 years of, of age. We're also including uh, recruiting same age men who have no history of repetitive head impact exposure. So this is known as the fine CTE study uh, where we've already gotten about uh, 12 people um, enrolled. And so we're really excited about what this study might show us. And it's really a proof of concept study. If we see a signal here, we'll, it'll allow us to go after larger grants to really build on it. So now what about routine MRI? So PET scans so far I've been talking to you about are really costly. Um, they're not accessible. Routine MRI, on the other hand, is integral component of the clinical evaluation of neurodegenerative disease. Every memory disorders, every thinking uh, disorder evaluation, MRI is really central to that evaluation because it allows you to look at different patterns of atrophy. And those patterns of atrophy or shrinkage in the brain can help you with uh, disease detection and differential diagnosis. Right now, there's not, there has not been a study to date that looked at the structural MRI patterns or atrophy in people where we know they have CTE. And that was the goal of this study that we just published this past year. Uh, we wanted to know what are the, the patterns of atrophy specific to CTE. So when we think about atrophy and CT, we can learn a lot from the brain bank. And so we see in, in the brain bank that um, atrophy, the frontal lobe is, is prominent, particularly, and it, it starts early, as is atrophy in the middle parts of the brain or, or medial temporal lobe where the memory centers are like the hippocampus. We also see kind of overall gross atrophy throughout the brain as shown in this picture here, the, these are spaces in the brain um, and the, you know, the larger the space, the more atrophy you can think of. And what we also tend to see is a tear in the tissue that separates the ventricles that as shown here, this is known as a cavum septum pellucidum. Now, while this is nonspecific and we see it, you know, there's neurodevelopment causes, we tend to see it higher in the setting of repetitive head impacts and CT. So maybe it could be some kind of supportive uh, feature to help for disease detection. So what we did in this study to characterize the pro structural MRI profiles of CTE was through everyone who donated their brain, we asked families for access to medical records. Through those medical records, we can actually get copies of the MRI discs. And those discs we took 
And we had three neuroradiologists rate them for at patterns of atrophy, patterns of vascular disease, and, and the presence of a cavum septum pellucidum. And so for this study, once we kind of narrowed it down to people who had autopsy confirmed CT, again, that's the, the most important part of the study. We know that these individuals had CTE because we were able to do the neuropathological workup. There was a total of 55 of them. And so we had 55 individual brain donors who had CT. Then we had a comparison group of 31 individuals who had normal cognition at the time of MRI. And we compared these two groups. The pe people with normal cognition were slightly older. Um, those with the CTE, most of them had symptoms. Many of them or most had dementia prior to death. And what we found was that those brain donors who had CTE had more shrinkage of the frontal and temporal regions of the brain. <clears throat> Whereas the parietal or the posterior parts of the brain were more preserved. And so that really maps on to what we see um, in terms of the distribution of tau and CTE. And what we also found was that the brain donors with CTE had in more atrophy and large ventricles, and they were at nearly seven times increased odds for having, having that cavum septum pellucidum or that tear in the tissue that separates the ventricles. And so here's some images just to show you, kind of bring it, uh, show you what we found. So here A and C is uh, an MRI of an individual who had autopsy confirmed CTE. B and D is an individual at normal cognition. And so you can see if you compare A and B, there's more spaces in the tissue, meaning there's more atrophy. Whereas here in B, and the tissue is tight together, pressing up against the bone. And so this shows you more frontal, temporal, parietal atrophy in this individual who had CTE. And then down here, C and D, this is showing uh, the hippocampus or memory centers of the brain. And you can see here, there's more space around the hippocampus, meaning more atrophy, where there's not space here for this person normal cognition. So this was a, a really exciting study in, for, for clinicians. Um, because it really suggests that maybe frontal temporal shrinkage of the brain in CT is a characteristic MRI finding. And that's the cavum septum pellucidum could be used to help us support a diagnosis. But again, we still need to do more. We need to know how these patterns differ from things like Alzheimer's disease, things like frontal temporal dementia. Now, MRI can also be used to help us under, understand how repetitive head impacts lead to other types of pathologies and how those other types of pathologies might contribute to the clinical symptoms we see in this setting. So Dr. McKee and several of us published this paper in 2020, where we showed that the, the tau of CTE is associated with increased odds for dementia in 359 uh, brain donors who had CTE in this study. But we also know that the tau of CTE is, doesn't correlate with all symptoms in the brain bank. For example, while it's closely associated with cognitive symptoms in this study, it was not as closely associated or not associated with the presence of behavioral and mood symptoms in, the, in, this, in this instance. So one pathology that we're really quite interested in is injury to the white matter. And that was the objective of this study we published in 2014, was what are, is white matter injury a long-term consequence of repetitive head impacts? And does that contribute to some of the symptoms we see in this setting? So to break, it, break this study down, we first modeled this relationship. So more years of football play was associated with more, more severe tau in the frontal lobe, which led to increased odds for dementia. This is a pathway that I showed you earlier. What's new here is we introduce injury to the white matter. So more years of football play, was associated with more severe white matter loss, which also correspond to increased odds for dementia. And we also found that small vessel disease contributed to dementia, but that was not associated with years of football play in this, in this study. So our conclusion here was that um, dementia and CT is likely associated with the multiple pathologies that repetitive head impacts might trigger like tau, like white matter injury. And then we also have these other variables like small vessel disease that stem from hypertension or other factors that contribute as well. Now going back to MRI, can we use MRI to detect some of this white matter injury 
on a very routine sequence that everyone gets as part of a, an evaluation. So if you look up actually in the corner of this slide, this is called a flare sequence. And um, this is again, very routine in the setting of a memory disorders workup. And we often evaluate it for injury to the va uh, vascular injury that might cause thinking and memory symptoms. And you see the bright white spots or white matter hyperintensities signal injury to the white matter. And what we're wondering is does that, does it do those bright spots, can we, does it capture some of the white matter pathologies from repetitive head impacts? So this was a study that we just published uh, in this year led by uh, Madeline Uretsky, who uh, manages the, the, the brain bank and the UNITE study, where we looked at the association between the flare lesions that I just showed you and neuropathology and brain donors from the brain bank. And so this was a sample of 75 uh, brain donors. They were about 67 years old. Most of them were football players, about almost 90%. Um, about 70% had CTE with 50% having severe CTE. And again, a lot of them had um, dementia prior to death. We quantified the, the volume of white matter hyperintensities uh, shown here. So the top is the flare sequence and the bottom in the orange is the, is the pipeline or the toolbox we used that to estimate the total volume of these lesions. And here's just another example of showing kind of different, different scans and how this, this uh, toolbox or pipeline is quantifying the lesions. And ultimately what we found that the more lesions on those flare scans corresponded to more white matter loss at autopsy, more small vessel disease as highlighted here in yellow, but also it was associated with a tau of CTE. And the more white and the more years of American football play also correspond to more white matter hyperintensities on their flare screens, as shown here. In fact, here's a, just an exemplar image of two individuals who played uh, American football players, two individuals who did not have that, uh, hypertension or diabetes. One played 33 years of play, one played nine years, and you can see how much more white matter hyperintensities is in this individual as compared to this. Now, this is just an example image, but it kind of overall shows you this relationship depicted in, in this scatter plot. And finally, the white matter hyperintensities on those flare scans also associated with more thinking and memory problems and trouble with functioning. So that study further suggests that repetitive head impacts, from, particularly from American football, has lasting effects on the white matter and that these white matter injury can contribute to symptoms and maybe there are potential pathways that we need to target for therapy. And Dr. McKee and myself and Dr. Rabinovich from the UCSF, uh, Chris, Dr. Nowinski and the Concussion Legacy Foundation is also leading recruitment. We just got funded to, to do a deep dive on the long-term effects of repetitive head impacts in the vascular system. This is funds from the NIH. And what this, this study is just getting ready to launch and we're really, trying to answer the question is how do repetitive head impacts from contact sports affect the white matter? And how do those injuries correspond to symptoms? And what's cool about this study is that we're recruiting all types of contact sport athletes, men and women from all different sports, all different levels of play. We're trying to recruit 200. And then we're going to also recruit 100 people who don't have repetitive head impact history. And it'll involve a one to two day evaluation either at Boston or at the University of California, San Francisco, will they undergo really a, a comprehensive thinking and memory exams, MRI, and blood draw. And we're really hoping that this study will, will inform on how repetitive head impacts are, are affecting the vascular and the white matter of the brain. So if I had to summarize all of the science, and I'm just realized I misspelled the word science in this slide, so that, my apologies. <laughs> but if I had to summarize all of the science what we've done, what the literature from other institutions have done, I think it comes down to these, to these um, five points. The neuropathology of CT, what it looks like in the brain when someone passed away is increasingly well-defined. We see that repetitive head impacts is necessary, but not sufficient for CT. This link has been shown uh, rather consistently. We are closing in on the specific signs and symptoms of CT, but, but I think a lot more work needs to be done on this front. 
We're also trying, we're also beginning to identify the specific biomarker patterns, the specific patterns on MRI that might be associated with CT. And we're using these biomarkers to better understand the different etiologies of the symptoms in this setting. But again, we need further research that compares people at risk for CT versus other types of disease so we can increase our specificity. And I think there's several areas to be addressed. Generalizability. How do these uh, results translate to the general population, to other contact sports, to high school players, college players? How do, they how do they translate to women? We don't know those answers. We don't know answers about epidemiology. We still need to be able to diagnose it during life. We're getting uh, closer, but we're, we're still, like I said, need more work. And also, what are the thresholds for exposure? How much is too much? Those are type, or, or what are the most important parts of the exposure? Is it the frequency or is it intensity? Those are the questions we need to answer. But it is a major public health concern. A large proportion of our society is exposed to repetitive head impacts. We've studied football, but we know other contact sport athletes. This is military service are exposed to repetitive head impacts. And I think that the public health concern is really reflective in the, in the ongoing initiatives from the National Institutes of Health. These have become, um, there's been multiple calls for grants, for proposals, to, for funding opportunities to study CTE throughout the past few years. They're all kind of listed here. And I really want to thank everyone, um, and particularly the participants, and particularly the families who participate in the research. This could not be done without you. Um, and and your, your contributions are advancing uh, the field in ways that you couldn't even imagine. And we're so grateful for all your time. And I also thank, of course, the Concussion Legacy Foundation, Dr. Nowinski, Lisa McHale, everyone there. And I also want to thank all of the BUCT Center, the, the people at the VA for those hours of work of, 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 the, of examining the brains. Um, it's a wonderful team and I couldn't be more thrilled to be a part of it. So thank you so much for having me and I'm happy to take a few questions. Great job, Dr. Lasco. Thank you so much. That was a tour de force. And just to quickly mention, um, you know, Dr. Lasco and I and, and members of the BU, VA, and CLF teams spent the weekend in Las Vegas with 100 family members, some of whom are here today, of our brain donors, because behind all those numbers and all those findings are you know, 1,250 families who have uh, made an extraordinary contribution to this research. So thank you so much for all that we've been able to learn. Um, so we've got a lot of questions. So let's we're going to try to give the fast answers. We won't. We'll try to get to them all, and we won't go too deep. So you want to some the status of diagnosing living people. You covered uh, treatments. A lot of questions around treatments. I know the answers are very limited. So what would be your answer, Dr. Lasco? Yeah, I would say there's there's none. People are trying to think of, uh, and we're often approached for different anti uh, anti tau type treatments. But the fact of the matter remains that you know, we really need to focus on detecting it accurately during life before we can start enroll people in treatment trials to see if treatments work. Right. And so I would say, and, and, and based on the chats, if anybody does have concerns about their own treatment or treatment of a loved one, uh, please reach out to the CLF helpline. We'll give you one-on-one -on -one support, including trying to find the best qualified doctor in your area to help understand a case of suspected CTE. I will say one more thing about treatment though. Through our experiences at the clinic, we get people who are concerned. I will say that a lot of the symptoms that we see, um, we have known treatments for them that, that, that are really important targets for intervention. So people who come concerned for depression, irritability, we, can, we know of treatments that work for that. And so I think it's important to focus on those symptoms that we know how to treat and, and go after that because they can result in benefits and including in thinking and memory. Yeah, and especially for, for also for midlife, we're talking about anxiety, depression, those sorts of things. You know, clinicians are very experienced at treating it in general. We don't know which people have CT that makes it more difficult. A few questions on genetics. Uh, some folks from Brown University asking about APOE4. So do you want to give a little more into what we know about genetics and or where we're going? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. We are looking at genetics, including APOE. We have published on uh, TMEM. Um, that I did not present here, but these are all uh, of investigation. And, and in fact, some of one published ones being worked on now. So I won't get into it too much, but yeah, I think these will be really important 
affect modifiers and ultimately influence who does and does not go on to, to develop CT among people exposed to repetitive head impacts. Uh, so why don't we address, the, and, and maybe I can help you with this, the, the lack of women in this research right now. I have my answers, but what you want to answer that first? Yeah, it's a, I mean, short answer is, is a problem. We need to. And, and actually, so we're making really uh, strong efforts now to do so. In fact, uh, myself and Dr. Mez and actually Dr. Winsky is part of it as well. We just submitted a grant to specifically recruit and enroll women who, are, who, who um, had uh, intimate partner violence. And that is something that we really want to study. And we're, we're hoping we actually get the reviews from that grant this, this month. And hopefully, you know, it's successful and we can really focus in on that. But I do think, you know, we have very few women, obviously, in the brain bank. Um, but there, I do think the numbers are going up. And uh, we're trying to kind of increase our outreach and recruitment on that front. And I know Dr. Nguyen can speak more to that, too. Um, but I think it's a we want to be able to study them and we're working on it. In fact, the HIT study, which I also mentioned, is also focusing more uh, on women, as is the recent study Project SAVE. You know, we're, we're now designing all of our stuff. We've learned a lot from American football and it's served and it's taught us a lot about CT. Now we're going to the other populations like women and, and all of our studies are, are being inclusive of these populations so we can learn about them. Right. And now I'll also add that. Um... The BUCT Center has a clinical study right now that we helped recruit for and provided funding for um, called, uh, I'm on a name, where we recruited uh, members from the women's national team, soccer team from the 90s, sort of the first generation who played, uh, where a lot of them played into their adult years. And, um, and we're getting a window. They're coming to Boston and being seen clinically. Most of them have pledged their brain. We're proud to have granted to Chastain and Michelle Akers from that team pledged to donate their brains. So uh, we are trying to raise awareness of this. A lot of our Olympians uh, are, are currently uh, out there at the uh, Olympics. Ezra Ruggiero was announcing them, uh, some of the others. We're trying to, again, raise that profile so these cases come in. It is a harder conversation with families when they call about their mothers than it is their fathers. It's just a reality right now. But um, we thank all of our female pioneers. The other question that, uh, uh, similar to that is around race. So the donor specimens questions are they are disproportionately Caucasian based on the demo demographic makeup of the NFL. And I, I'm happy to answer that one just because it's a conversation we have a lot of. Um, it's disproportionate to today's NFL, but not necessarily the historical NFL. Um, and we're very proud to have a lot of the um, first black football players at a number of universities who have donated to this. Um, so you know, be, because of the way things were handled in the past, um, there weren't as many opportunities. But it has changed now, and it is a big focus of ours for our recruiting, for our clinical recruiting, um, and it is, it is a big priority. And, I, and I'll just add to that, Chris, too. In our living studies, uh, again, of former uh, NFL players who are 50 years or older, um, we have 40 to 50 percent who, who identified as Black, which is consistent with their generation of play, to my knowledge. Uh, unlike now, where it's more along the lines of 70%. But uh, your point's well taken. And then there's definitely concerted efforts to 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 address that as well. Yeah. And uh, what about efforts to engage with youth, high school players, and parents? What do we tell them? Yeah, I mean, I think that crosses more in, into your territory, um, Chris. But, you know, um, yeah, I think it's, uh, there, the, there needs to be, education and awareness to parents and others who, who make the decision for their for their kids to to play football um and they need to know about this research a, a, in order to be informed about that decision uh, a question from victoria and hank bjorkland from our new york advisory board and mike we talked about this specifically uh mri based research uh, P, uh individuals pacemakers are often excluded because of the additional risks to them and you know is that is that that's very difficult to change right yeah so some of the more recent pacemakers you can get an mri uh it does involve a few more logistical steps that complicate things but i would say it's definitely not impossible we've done it before for other studies um but yeah some studies do exclude um but not all okay and then quickly on symptoms before I, we're gonna have to wrap to get to our wonderful panel 
Um, so someone asked, does, does, can CT resemble bipolar disorder? So would you talk a little bit about the, you know, the midlife symptoms that our patient or our people report? Right. So it's a good, so when you think of a psychiatric illness like bipolar disorder, you think about that manifesting across the person's lifespan, right? So here, what we often see is, is onset of these symptoms in, in individuals who are in midlife, despite no prior history, and then also individuals perhaps without a family history. And so that's something that's a little bit atypical for when you're just thinking about a bipolar disorder. You know, the symptoms um, can overlap, um, but I think you need to consider the other data points and that's how we really differentiate or can differentiate the two, but it, it can be challenging, um, especially when you have someone who has that lifelong history and there is family history. Um, but yeah, they're, they're, they're different though. And when you think about kind of the person's entire lifespan. Yeah, and then another, I'll maybe end with this, Graham Manley just threw in, I think it's an important question, theories as to why younger patients in lower stage CT have higher rates of suicide. And so and what are your thoughts there? So theories on why younger patients with the lower stage, yeah, I mean, well, I guess there's two ways to answer this question. So one is people who die by suicide, um, tend to be younger and therefore they have lower stage CT because CT is closely associated with age. Um, but I also like to, to mention, you know, um, suicide is very complex, the very complicated construct. There's a lot of factors that go into it. Um, while it might be contributing, we also need to consider the person's kind of entire life, life history and all the factors that might contribute to that. And to draw kind of causal inferences on the two, I think, uh, is uh, is can be can be risky or, or challenging. Yeah, yeah. Well, well said. And just to repeat that, like suicide is always is the number two or three cause of death for young people. Lower stage CT is associated with younger age, so it could again, it could be an, could be an artifact of that. Or, but we are actively investigating what is the relationship between having the disease and suicide because there's lots of situations where believe it seems associated. And the other factor is that concussions associated with suicide and is an independent variable. Um, and these all, almost everyone in CT has had concussions, whether or not they've, they've been diagnosed. So there's a zillion questions. They're great questions, but we're gonna have to let you go. Um, and we'll answer these in a future, a, a future webinar. If you'll come back. Yeah, of course, I, anytime, <laughs> this is fun. Okay. All right. Yeah, well, you did a great job. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the great questions. Now we're going to get to our panel and um, I will be talking to you soon, Mike, about recruiting for all those great studies you are leading. All right. Thank you. And thank you all so much for having me. Okay. All right. So the effects of this disease are felt far beyond just the person experiencing symptoms. We know it can have a tremendous impact on families and that impact is important to recognize and talk about so that others who are going through similar experiences do not feel alone. And that's why we're thrilled to kick off the second half of our webinar where we'll speak to members of our legacy family community to hear about their experience with diagnosed CTE. So to begin, we are well, excited to welcome our first two guests, Barbara Pinder and Becky Faze, who are here to share their experiences with CTE with their spouse. Barbara Pinder is the white wife of late a former NFL player, Cyril Pinder, who passed away at age 74 last year. He was drafted by the Eagles in 1968. He was a standout running back at Illinois, where I am from. Cyril was traded to the Bears, and the Pinders decided to make Chicago their permanent home. Cyril finished his career in Dallas and transitioned to television sales at ABC. He retired as a senior sales executive after 35 years. Cyril was heavily involved in the community, and while he was alive, doctors diagnosed us with Parkinson's diagnosed with Parkinson's disease and progressive supranuclear palsy or PSP. Uh, he had both those diseases, but he also had stage four CTE when his brain was studied. Becky Faze is a widow of former Kearney State University offensive lineman Dennis Faze. While Dennis was in his 40s, he began experiencing issues with his memory. He battled a series of health problems before his death at 51 in 2019, including alcoholism. Dennis was diagnosed with stage three CT by researchers at the Brain Bank. Barbara, Becky, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you for Barbara, having us. Thank you, thank you. Barbara, uh, to begin, could you tell us about your husband, Cyril, and, and when you started noticing changes? 
Um, my husband was, uh, we, we were college uh, uh, kids together and uh, we grew up together. That's the point. And so I knew him when he was studying and working hard and he was a really, really nice guy, affable. Everybody liked Cyril, joking, uh, very, very disciplined. Um, worked very hard at everything he did. About 2012, he had uh, been working in television sales and um, he had uh, gone to have a knee replacement surgery. And all of a sudden things weren't quite right. Cyril's disposition was not the same. Most of the time he was the same, but he couldn't remember things. And uh, we, we didn't know what was wrong about that time. We started hearing about the movie and the book Concussion. And so we went to, um, I encouraged him to go to doctors to uh, start investigating what might be wrong because the, the personality would change from time to time. He was never mean or anything like that, but it just wasn't that same uh, happy guy all the time. I mean, not that everybody's that happy, anybody's happy all the time, but things began to change and we had to start looking at what might be wrong. And as his symptoms progress, if you want to talk about some of the symptoms later on in life, how did it affect you and your family? Well, um, Cyril and I have no children. Uh, my brother came to stay with us, live with us. Um, I began to be the person who was uh, more or less in charge. And I had to take care of everything in the house, in, the, in our marriage, everything. But also I realized that I needed to take care of Cyril to see what was going on with his health. Um, I was working most of the time um, and Cyril had retired, but I had to put things into place to follow up to, to uh make sure that he was going to be healthy. And so it was a, it was a great deal of stress. Uh, later on, uh, as he became um, more and more ill, uh, I, we used to joke, I had a, a, a little hospital set up in, in our, in our uh, condo here in Florida because he had 24 hour care. Uh, we made the decision that as long as we could stay together, we would stay together. Not because a nursing home isn't a wonderful place for people who have to be there, but um, let's face it, nursing homes are, are overworked. The people can't give one-on-one um, -on -one care to the individuals who were in the, the nursing home. Cyril stayed in the nursing home for two weeks while I had to, uh, while I was working on retrofitting our house so that he could stay in the house. And um, so as he became more and more ill, I had equipment here, I had supplies, we had, I was never in the house by myself because he had a caregiver. There, was, there were always three people around, Cyril, the caregiver, and me. Um, there was a lot of stress because uh, we didn't have the kind of support. We were, I was figuring it out all by myself. Right. And I'd go to the doctor, you know, this neurologist said this, that neurologist said that. Uh, we'd have to go to therapies. Cyril, Cyril's care and keeping became number one priority. Yeah, yeah. And, and how, how did that, I mean, you talk about the stress, but let's dig into that. I mean, I'm assuming you never expected to be a caregiver. You know, how did you cope with that? How did you handle that? Or, or did, did it become too much because you didn't have the support and help and knowledge you needed? Well, uh, I studied everything I could find. I uh, reached out to everybody I could. Uh, Cyril and I always had a really, really good support system. We had lots of friends. Um, we were in various organizations. Um, Cyril was in uh, 
uh, community organizations. We, we did a lot of things. And so I relied on people, the support that I had. Um, that's one of the things that I would encourage anybody who has to go through something like this, make sure that you try to stay in touch with your support group, family, friends, uh, organizations. Uh, I would sign up for different uh, um, uh, seminars, anything that you can do, anything that could be done, I tried to do to make sure that uh, I was getting what I needed. Um, and I studied, I, I, I read everything I could, I could read. And Cyril, one of the things that um, he did when that movie Concussion came out in the book, uh, his eyes had started to fail. And so I had uh, gotten audible for him and he must have listened to that book four or five times. Wow. And he was concerned. And on days that he, he could, well, initially he could still talk at the end of his life. He, uh, talking was very, very difficult for him. And um, we agreed during that time to learn as much as we could and do as much as we could because he decided that he wanted to donate his brain so that nobody else would have to go through what he was going through. Yeah, and what was your reaction to his diagnosis? Um, well, of course I was very, very uh, sad. I mean, we had, I mean, and when I say sad, it was like at the core of my being, I was, uh, devastated, but I didn't have time to be too devastated for too long because I couldn't be still. I still had things to do. I had to keep us up and running. Uh, my way of handling things was to face it and let's, let's keep moving. I, Cyril had as good a social life after he was diagnosed as I could give him. We went places. It got to be a point where the three of us, Cyril, the caregiver, and me, we went every place. He had, to the extent that I could, he had a normal living situation. He got to see all of his friends. He got to go to places. We went to jazz shows. We went to church every Sunday. We kept it going as long as we could. Wow. Okay, so now I'm gonna I'm gonna come back to you with some more questions, but now I'm gonna uh, shift over to Becky. So thank you, Becky. The story that you wrote about your husband for our website, and we're putting the link in the chat now, was very powerful, very eye opening. For those who may not have read it, could you tell us about Dennis and how he became someone you didn't recognize? Yes, yes. So Dennis and I met after college. He played college football. Um, I did not know him then. He apparently was a beast. Uh, offensive lineman. He was 265 in college. When I met him, he weighed 190, 185, 190. So he, he was a completely different person when I met him physically. Um, but his character, he, everyone loved Dennis. He was funny, hardworking, disciplined, Barbara, very similar to your husband, it sounds like. Very disciplined, perfectionist. Everything he did, he did with, with everything he had. Um, and I've heard he played football in the same manner. So, um, he was fantastic. We, we got married, had three beautiful children. And in his early 40s, I thought something's not quite right. He, he would forget entire conversations. I mean, it started off small. He would forget little things. Over the years, within just a couple of years, he would forget entire conversations and get very defensive about it. When I had the discussion with him, he, no, he didn't forget. We never discussed it. He got very defensive. And I think that goes back to him being a perfectionist and, and not wanting to, to see or realize that really there was something going on with him. Um, it came to the forefront for me. I saw an article and I live in Colorado. I was reading the Denver Post and there was an article on Kelly McGregor, who was an NFL player, also worked for the, the Colorado Rockies baseball team. And his wife was quoted in that article and she talked about how Kelly's personality had changed over the years. And he was later diagnosed with CTE. But reading that article, I thought, oh, my gosh, that's Dennis, because he was this fabulous, very social, very loving, wonderful person. And slowly that was changing. And he was much more irritable, 
Um, he de definitely more snappy with the kids, not as social and just odd. Um, he started, other symptoms started happening. He had severe neuropathy in his legs. And so his movements were, were not what he would want. Um, he was diagnosed with Guillain-Barre, um, which is a, a disorder that attacks your, your immune system, attacks your nerves. So he was treated for Guillain-Barre. He, with that, had cognitive impairment. And so doctors weren't quite sure if that was tied into Guillain-Barre or what was happening with that. So I took him to multiple hospitals, including Mayo Clinic, and said, I think my husband has CTE. And absolutely no one would talk to me about CTE. This was in 2016. Um, UC Health in Denver would not talk about CTE. No one wanted to talk about it. I didn't know a ton about it. I didn't know about um, concussion, Le concussion Legacy Foundation. So I did not get online, did not look for resources. I assumed since all these professionals were telling me mm -hmm. it's not CTE or wouldn't even talk about it, okay, it's not CTE. In my heart, I knew he had CTE. I knew Dennis, I knew how disciplined he was and how wonderful, and I saw the changes. I knew he had CTE. Wow. Um, well, tell us about how this affected you and your relationship. And, and you know, I mean, we 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 know we all know the stories of how much uh, the men who have been diagnosed with this have struggled. But it's really about your perspective. How how did it affect you guys and you? So Dennis, he turned to alcohol, and I can only imagine he was trying to dumb down what was happening in his brain. So he turned to alcohol and it completely changed his personality. Um, he became very alienated from myself and the kids, which makes me incredibly sad. Um, the kids didn't wanna be home alone with him. Um, so if I had to go anywhere, it was always an ordeal. Um, we had incredible stress in our lives. I didn't know where Dennis was. He was still working um, and he would go to work some days, some days he wouldn't. I would get calls from the office. And I would think, where's Dennis? Nobody knew where Dennis was. So I started tracking him um, through his phone and I would then go find him and he'd be sitting in a car, um, passed out with the car running, sitting in a parking lot. Uh, so incredibly different than the person he was. He would have been horrified at what was happening with him. He would have been horrified at what he was doing. His appearance changed. He was always pristine. He cared so much about his physical appearance. He worked out, he ate healthy. Um, he always looked put together. As time progressed, he, his appearance did not matter. Um, he, yeah, he would have been horrified. Um, so it alienated him from our family. And again, like I said, that makes me incredibly sad. It got to the point where I couldn't leave the kids home with Dennis. Um, two of them went off to college. Um, I still had the baby at home. He was 15, I think at that point. And I told Dennis, you either have to get help, you have to go back into rehab, or you have to move out. And he chose moving out. So he was not living at home when he passed away. Um, so that was really, really difficult. Yeah, yeah, no, thank you for, for sharing that. Um, you know, there's a lot in the power of stories. So I wanna I wanted thank you for sharing it because, you know, I think it is very interesting that Lori's stories help open your eyes to this issue and your story is gonna open up so many other people's eyes to this issue. Um, but can you, can you speak to that about um, just how important that storytelling and being brave like you're doing right now is uh, to help people understand what's happening in their lives? I think it's incredibly important um, for a couple of reasons. First of all, it can open someone's eyes to the problem. I had heard of CTE, but I, I didn't think much about it until I read that article and it made perfect sense as to what was happening in our lives. So Lori opened my eyes and made me aware that this is probably CTE. That's probably what we're dealing with. Um, the second thing is if you share your story and someone reads your story, they know they're not alone. So other people are going through this. There is a community now that they can be part of. Everything's easier with the community. Absolutely. And Barbara, I'll come back to you for a few minutes and I'll come back to you again, Becky. But the, um, you know, the, you're, part of the reason I wanted to share your stories is it, these seem to be what we say in the, in the team, two sort of phenotypes of CT that we see. We see people who seem to have 
successful lives, and actually the majority of our people, our brain bank, um, don't have the uh, midlife things that destroy their lives. And then it becomes usually memory problems and some other issues and not, can often lead to dementia. And then we have a, a very significant number of people whose lives seem to go off the rails, you know, midlife. And, and this is what I'm seeing in friends of mine. And, um, and we're still trying to connect those dots as to why and how we help them. But we're learning from your experiences. So Barbara, why is it important for you to, to share your story with us today? Uh, it's important for me to share my story because I want other people to understand what could go wrong what might go wrong, what the potential for it to go wrong is very, very great. Um, Cyril started falling. It, that is a part of the, the, what would happen with the disease. And he'd fall and he's always falling and, you know, and you, you don't know what's going on, you know, and there's nobody to follow up. And I became the advocate. I want other people to know that it could happen to them, and certainly we don't want it to, but that they need, particularly the wives or family, somebody has to be an advocate. Somebody has to help them. It's not that they're not good, they're not good enough, they're, they're wonderful, they're ill. But when you're ill, you need someone who can stand stand up for you. Someone who could go to the doctor and say, this is not the way he used to be. There is a problem here. And um, I think I became quite a pest. And I know that uh, because I had to continue, well, asking it in a different way, going to a different person, trying to make sure that I wasn't leaving anything unturned. Um, not leaving anything undone. But you can only do that if you make the decision to be an advocate. And one of the things uh, about Cyril and I, we were the same age. I was tired too. He was old, I was old. And so, uh, but we decided we've always moved along together. And that was a good thing. So he trusted me and he went with me. I was the one who could say, hey, well, we need to go and do this. And he, you know, try to do it because um, as he used to say, well, I have to be coachable now. And somebody needs to know it. The other wives, the football players, those people who are going through different things. Uh, if, if, if my story can help anybody, any piece of it, if they recognize themselves in that story, then I will feel that Cyril and I have done a good thing. That's, that's amazing. Uh, it's a great sentiment. So is there anything you wish you had known about CT and caregiving you know, during, the, during the difficult days that you could share? CTE, I, that, that is so elusive to me. That, that whole thing, um, I don't know what, what I could know uh, about it to make it better, to, to uh, help navigate that. The one thing that I wish I had known um, all the implications of it so that I wouldn't think that perhaps I wasn't doing enough. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there was nobody to, to, to uh, connect the dots. There was no body that I could go to and they'd say, well, now you should do this and then you should do that and you should do the other thing. There was nobody. And to be a caregiver, um, that's something. I mean, I, I didn't train for that. I trained for a lot of things, but to be a caregiver, um, that's, that's something that takes over your entire life. Yeah. It takes over your entire life. And I think um, the thing that you have to do is be prepared to have your life taken over by another purpose. Yeah, that's uh, really well said. Um, all right, thank you. Going back to you, Becky. Um, now that you, you have the diagnosis, you know, what now you understand that you were right. Like, what do you wish 
that you knew or, or and how how do you think we can help other families going through what, what you went through? Well, I think it's improving on its own just over time. It's becoming more common. Doctors are more willing to talk about it. Um, I wish I could have gotten a doctor to at least enter the discussion with me and, and throw that out as a possibility because it would have helped Dennis, I think, to know what was happening with him, um, why he, his behavior was changing, why he wasn't able to be the, uh, the professional he had been in the past and the successful man that he had been. Um, the diagnosis itself was a, a massive relief for the kids and I, and for Dennis's parents and, and siblings. Um, we knew there had to be something that changed his behavior so drastically. So we were, it was a huge sense of relief to know that he did indeed have CTE because that gave us some answers. Um, I didn't know about uh, the Concussion Legacy Foundation. Uh, it's a fantastic resource. I actually work as a mentor for the hotline. So if you call into the helpline, um, you may get paired up with me and, and we're just there to, to support you, to listen to your stories, to share our stories, to answer questions, um, just to know you're not alone. And so that's the biggest part of all of this, to know that you're not alone and there are resources and this organization is unbelievable. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, I mean, your story just reminds me of, um, you know, again, so many people that I know personally that have gone through similar things. And, and I guess maybe what I'm even thinking now is that, you know, there, there does seem to come to a point with a lot of our cases and, and people I've known personally where the alcohol or the substance abuse just takes over. And I think that's why it's so important for you both to share your stories so that people might identify these problems earlier and connect the dots that they might be related to brain injury or CT so that perhaps they can get help with a, a doctor who understands this before, before it's too late. Um, so, so thank you for mentoring for the helpline. Uh, and Barbara, if we haven't asked you yet, I'm going to be asking you to mentor for the helpline as well, because you know, <laughs> your wisdom is, is so appreciated. So um, before we move on to the children of people with CTA, I, I welcome any final thoughts or advice for the spouses in our audience, starting with you, Barbara. Uh, if I had any advice, I would say to, to the spouses, uh, not to be afraid to get in there, go with your husband to the doctor. Uh, so many men, I mean, even people who don't play football, the wives are, uh, they know nothing about the doctor, uh, what their husband's doctors are saying to them. Uh, they don't go with their husbands. And I know that's a, that's a hard thing to do if, uh, if uh, a man is very, very private, and typically they are. Uh, but don't be afraid to try it. Try to get in there so that you can work with the physicians and your in your husband's care and keeping. Hopefully, they they don't they don't have the 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 degree of uh, impairment that um, some of us have seen. But at least you're not caught by surprise, and you're ready to 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 be able to take up the reins if necessary, to be that advocate, be that support, be that partner as your husband has to navigate through a, um, uh, a morass of uh, physicians and medical processes. Yeah, well, thank you so much. And Becky, same question, final, final thoughts and advice. Yeah, my best advice would be Follow your gut, follow, trust your instincts. You know your loved one better than anyone. Um, if you suspect CTE, if you see that personality changing over time, don't question yourself, uh, address it, get as much help as you can uh, and just be there for them. Um, I, I saw a question in the comments. Oh, Diane, you asked if, if it's 24 seven that you, this illness shows its ugly face. Uh, no, it wasn't 24 seven. Dennis could be completely normal parts of every day. He was at work the day before he passed away. It's, it's, a, it's an incredibly cruel disease. You, you're not sick 24 seven, at least Dennis wasn't. Um, he could have completely normal time. So that, that makes it even harder to understand. Yeah, uh, well said. All right, Barbara, Becky, thank you so much for sharing your stories and your hard earned wisdom with us today. Thank you. Thank you. All right. 
Okay, so next, uh, we are excited to welcome Rebecca Carpenter and Samantha Pyle Buono, both of whom are children of fathers diagnosed with CTE. Rebecca Carpenter, Beck, as I like to call her, is a daughter of former NFL running back Lou Carpenter, who passed away at age 78 in 2010. After his death, researchers at the VA BUCLF Brain Bank diagnosed him with stage 4 CTE. Who played 10 seasons in the NFL for the Lions, Browns, and Packers and won three NFL championships. Years after his play ended, he began to suffer with a number of symptoms we now know are from CTE. Rebecca directed a film about her father, Requiem for a Running Back, I almost said it perfectly, which takes viewers through a re-examination of her father's life and the cost-benefit analysis of football. Samantha Pyle Buono is the daughter of former NFL player Mike Pyle, who passed in 2015, and she also has another family member in the brain bank we could talk about. After a nine-year career as a line with the Bears, Mike began to change, and after years of suffering and ultimately ending up in a memory care facility where Mike could not even remember that he'd been a championship uh, with a championship NFL team, he passed away at 76. He also, also diagnosed with stage four CTE. Rebecca, Sam, thank you so much for joining us. Of course. It's good thank to see you. you. It's good to see you, Samantha. So I was with you two days ago in Las Vegas. Um, all right. So I know your stories well. I know you well. Thank you for everything you've done to teach us about the, the child's experience. So I'll start with you, Rebecca. When did you first start to notice something was wrong? How did the symptoms progress and how did it impact your family? Yeah, great question. And um, hi, Sam. So Sam doesn't know. Really. <laughs> um, and also, I just have to say really quick, I got my posse is on here, as it turns out. I see a lot of my girlfriends who are on this call. So hi, everybody. I hope I can see you face to face soon. Um, one of the one of the strangely odd great things about what you guys have done is meeting so many people who I, I consider extended family now. But um, OK, I'd say um, around when I was seven. Um, I first remember him going from sort of jolly to explosive, and it was really unpredictable. Hey. And um, I, I can remember just sort of like compartmentalizing that. And, um, and that would just sort of, that just sort of steamrolled. Um, he was about 40 then. And then I would say by his mid fifties, he had become sort of um, slightly withdrawn, explosive about uh, small things now before it would have been like something that, that was would have annoyed me as a mother for instance this now became small things in the house um, by the time he was in his 70s he'd become really withdrawn really isolated which was really tough because my dad was really outgoing had been had been really outgoing and the thing that I would add that um, some people on this call may really identify with was um, because my dad had played in the NFL for 10 years and then coached in the NFL for 31 years. Um, we were such a part of that community. Our entire identity was so much being part of this huge family and then keeping this secret, trying to keep this secret and then kind of keep him under wraps also to keep the secret and, um, and how isolating that was. So I would say that the parallel story to his symptoms, the parallel story was our family becoming more and more isolated. So. Yeah. Uh, all right. And I'm going to come back and forth with you because I know your story as well. So Samantha, how about you? When did you notice as a younger person when things were wrong? How did they progress? What was, what was the, when did it start to impact your family? I would say my first, I started noticing changes when my dad was about 50 and in his 50s. And that puts me as about a teenager. And um, it started with the rage and the impulsivity and uh, just acting like he wasn't himself. And I think it's important to say, because I've heard so many times, well, your dad probably already had a temper or he was an A-type personality to have played at the level that he played at. And, and while that's very true, and I would not uh, deny that he always had a temper, uh, I like to articulate it as he had a temper about things that other people got upset about. And the difference when he began to change was that he would start to overreact and go over the top about things that just made no sense. So the logic wasn't there anymore. And it was different than just being angry about things that make people angry. Um, that, of course, uh, went into, into his 60s. He did start to become withdrawn, 
which uh, was very different for us because my dad was a very social, very big personality in a room, lots of fun. Um, he was never home because he wanted to always be out and about. And so for him to not want to do that was clearly an indication that something was changing. And uh, ultimately he then did begin to display symptoms of dementia. And uh, as you already touched on by the time he uh, died at age 76 in a memory care facility, I would sit with him and show pictures of him playing. And he would comment in the third person and say, wow, that guy looks like he was really good. Uh -huh. So he had no memory of that. Um, I really relate to Rebecca saying that uh, when you have a parent who people know who they are and he's been in the limelight for a long time, you, it's embarrassing and you feel shame and you try to keep it a secret because people know who he is and you don't want them to know that he's behaving the way he's behaving. Um, and I'll leave that at there. And, yeah. and I know, I think you've talked in the past, there were some also some financial consequences. Uh, yeah, there were, you know, my dad attended Yale University. He was an intelligent man. He had a successful career for a while after he retired from football. And uh, he began to make very poor decisions and was unable to, eventually he was unable to hold down a job. He just kept getting involved in things that didn't even make sense. Although he originally had had a good business sense and uh, ultimately made terrible decisions with, uh, with his money. And you know, ended up with nothing. And, you know, it, it's difficult. I, you know, my dad and, and Rebecca's dad played in a time when they didn't make a lot of money to begin with. Um, but he had a career, he had a living after that, he made a decent living, and then made, as I said, made those poor decisions, and really ended up with nothing in the end. Wow. Yeah. All right. About going back to Rebecca, mm -hmm. you directed a very powerful documentary, Requiem for Running Back. Uh, can you tell us about that journey? Sure. Um, well, the day my dad died, I, I think I'm going to say, I'm going to guess that Chris Nowinski had um, set his Google alerts for NFL player death about that time, 2010. And that when somebody in the NFL died, um, they would cold call people and say, hey, <laughs> I'm laughing now because I have such a gallows humor about this now. I don't know any other way to like kind of get through a lot of this stuff anymore. And um, basically asked us if we would donate our dad's brain. I think he was case number 17. If uh, Doc, if, if, if uh, Mike Webster, Andre Waters and um, Long were numbers one through three and then Justin Strelzik was four, we were somewhere in that first bat, uh, batch. Um, we thought he was would be a control subject. Um, we had never, I'll try to just tell you what, what started the film. My father had been very ill from something else, um, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And when he was in the hospital, maybe a year before he died, um, the doctors were sort of talking us through his diagnosis. And then they said, and of course he has dementia. And we all looked at each other and we're like, he doesn't have dementia. He's always been this way. Like it was this really weird moment where literally it had never crossed our minds that that the way he was, was considered, a, would be considered a dementia diagnosis. Mm. So um, when we got the, um, the positive CTE diagnosis, I just had to really rethink my entire life because I had these two lives that were split, which was this public life and this private life and sort of never the twain shall meet. And I just, I guess I felt like I needed to integrate them. And I also wanted to hear the science for myself because as a total NFL brat, I was really suspicious of outsiders, but I was also smart enough to be suspicious of insiders. <laughs> so tell me, tell me what personality disorder that one is. So <laughs> that might just be intelligence, but anyway. Um, and so I just really wanted to find out for myself. And I met Sam through a girlfriend of mine in high school who didn't even introduce us over CTE. She just said, oh, the two of you need to meet. Like you have such similar stories. And we met for coffee and then suddenly started going, wait a second, like you really do have a similar story. And Sarah Naylor, who's on this call and Chie, I met, she's on the film at Chie going through what she went through with her husband, Steve and his um, ALS diagnosis. And 
anyway, just meeting so many amazing people um, who had very similar stories. And that's what the documentary is. Yeah, and I remember one of the powerful scenes in there was was you visiting Dr. McKee and 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 reviewing the brain. Tell us about that. Yeah, um, Dr. Key, McKee was gracious enough to give us an interview. I was still pretty suspicious, uh, just angry, I guess. And um, I got to see the slides of his actual brain, not just the tau stain slides, but like the slides of his actual brain. And then I got to go into the lab and see the pieces of his brain that had been set in this sort of gel that made it less um, wobbly. Um, and it was kind of amazing to really, um, the thing that, the one thing if you knew my dad, you would have said he had a lot of heart and his players he coached would always say like his thing on the field was, you gotta love it, you gotta love it. Like everything with him was like, you gotta love it. And, um, and suddenly like, to think that all of this stuff that was going wrong with him had to do with his brain. I know that's really corny, but that's really true. It was like, I was looking at the, his heart was huge, but his brain had shriveled and it was really just this weird moment of, of um, acceptance that this was, this had really happened. This had really happened to him. This had really happened to us. And now we were going to have to really like tell the truth about it. Yeah. One of the powerful lessons that I'd like both of you to comment on that I got when I saw it for the first time was the impact of not only you know birth order, but your age when dad began to, began to change and yes. how that affected your family, your interpretation of your father. So uh, Beth, could you speak to that? And then Sam, I want your thoughts as well. Yeah. Um, I'm the youngest of four. My oldest sister is nine years older than I am. And so all three of my sisters um, were part of my dad's life as a player and as a championship player. And um, so they had, they rode the highs big time of what it was like to be the child of a, of a championship player. Um, I was born the first year he was a coach. So um, not only did I not even know he was a football player because I didn't know you had to never crossed my mind that to coach football, you might've had to play football and he never talked about it. Um, so I knew a guy who was much less available, both emotionally, but also because of his temper. Um, I think I had a little bit of a, I was a little gun shy of him. Um, it made me really tough though, by the time I was a teenager, I was, I was, um, like, you know, um, I know this is being recorded, so I'm not going to use the F word, but it was like, I became a person you did not F with <laughs> because I had been trained by an NFL football player with CTE, like what you needed to do when, you know, things got a little crazy. So. Yeah. And your, and your pair and your older siblings just had different memory. They knew dad when he was really calm. different, yeah. um, calmer, like Sam said, you know, he's a he was a driving perfectionist, but what that looked like changed, like how it manifested changed. Um, so yeah, we really did. And it, and it does split the family apart. And I, the last thing I'll say is, you know, my mom is 88 now and she was recently diagnosed with Alzheimer's and, um, knowing now what I've learned about my dad has helped me a lot in approaching how I interact with my mom. But I can also see this is a really different animal. CTE and Alzheimer's are really different. I know every case is different, but still they're just fundamentally very different animals. And um, it, it's horrible watching someone you love slip away, but um, with CTE, you kind of, be, they become, they can become a little monstrous before they start to slip away, which, which makes it worse. You don't get to have those still like, oh, there she is. She's just dim, she's just dimming a little bit. Yeah, I hear you. And Samantha, what do you think? I mean, you so you're a little older than Rebecca when you first started noting, noticing it. So how did, and talk to you about that. Yeah, so, um, and, and I'm the oldest. I have a brother. We're very close in age. We're just two years apart. And, you know, I, I can't really speak to his experiences, but I, I think that he would want to say, and, and I would rec want to recognize that my experiences as a daughter are probably much different than his were as a son. Um, as he, you know, my dad began to ch began to change. And wh while I uh, I was not alive when my dad was still working with the NFL and playing with the NFL, he he did stay very uh, a part of it. And he was he did radio broadcasting and did shows and stayed affiliated with the Chicago Bears. So I, I I do remember that, and I remember him not being present and not being around. 
and thinking to myself, well, you know, it's okay because if he's busy while I'm growing up, I at least am going to have um, this great man who's going to be the grandfather of my kids. And, you know, he didn't play ball with us and he didn't go in the backyard and he wasn't around, but he will be for my kids. Uh, so for me, one of the biggest losses is that by the time I became an adult, because I was older when things happened, uh, that I had already really lost the essence of who he was. And my kids never, ever had that experience with him and those experiences with him. Um, but, go, you know, going back to, to my relationship with my father versus my siblings, I don't think I got the brunt of a lot of the difficult part of him. I think he was probably much harder on my brother. And because he was a boy and because there may have been an expectation to be more like him and to possibly even play football. So I think that I still had very loving and respectful feelings towards my dad and almost hero worshiped him. Whereas um, another child in our family or a male child might actually have negative feelings toward him. I, I think my brother would go so far as to say he disliked him at certain times, but I just didn't have that. So it was mm. that just added and compounded the, how devastated I was when I began to lose him at the time when I thought I was going to be able to start spending time with him and, and gaining him. Um, and, and through our helpline, you have served as a peer support volunteer for a lot of people, what we like to call a mentor. Why do you do that? Um, okay, so I do that because, and here's the thing, when Rebecca and I had coffee that first time, I cried. I cried and I cried and I cried. It was an out-of-body experience to know after keeping our ugly secret for so long that there was someone that it actually seemed like grew up in my house. Like, here was the sister that I never had, that knows what it felt like that all the things that I kept to myself and you know I, I did hero worship my father and I only you know I have many many wonderful beautiful positive things to say about him but there were things that were not good to talk about and those were locked up and I would have never let that out to anybody who didn't truly get it so to meet someone like Rebecca was to have someone that I could trust that I could confide in that I could say my dad was this bad thing without taking away from this great thing that he was. And so th that was huge. I also had, at the same time that I met Rebecca, I had, I just was so lucky. It was serendipitous that I met a few family members, mostly spouses of teammates that my dad had played with. And we were all just starting to talk about something's going on here, what's going on. And this group of wives that kind of took me in and I'm they're on the call today. I'm still friends with them. They were with me when I was going through it. They were with me afterwards. They're with me today. We are all in different phases of the disease. Some still have their family member living. Some have lost them just in a year, you know, recently a year ago. Some have lost them back when I did. But I can't tell you how invaluable it's been to just have someone who gets it. And if there's anything I could do to go and take away those 20 years when I had no idea what was going on and why, and why my dad didn't like me and why he was angry and why he was horrible. And quite frankly, I thought I'd write a book someday, not about brain injury, but about what it's like to live with an NFL player who's no longer in the limelight and now he's a jerk. Um, I really thought I'd write that book and uh, it's a different book now, but it's the same book and it is so important to connect with the people who are living in your book, even though your chapters are different and your stories are different. And I want to pay that forward. My father would have done it and it means the world to me to be able to do that. Wow, well said. All right, question for both of you. I'll go back to Rebecca first. So advice to children, mm. former football players or others concerned their father might have it. Yeah. And part two, advice to parents of mm. young children. Mm -hmm. Boy, it's really hard as a kid to, um, to when you're working on hitting sort of your developmental milestones that we all need to reach in order to, to become fully realized adults, to know that you don't have a guide there to provide you with that sort of scaffolding that you need sometimes to climb that little hill that you need to be climbing. Um, but I do think that um, we can, th th this is what I say, you know, every superhero and the DC, you know, in the Marvel Comics universe or DC Comics, 
they got their superpower because something really bad happened to them when they were a little kid. And, you know, you can try, my superpower became curiosity. I became super incredibly curious. See, look at that little one right there. Hi. Hi, you want to come sit again? Hi. Hi. I just wanted to have like two books in there. Okay. Well, you can sit here and listen if you want. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Hey, that's okay. Hi. How are you? Hi. Hi. Um, so I would say that um, that to really um, try to, to, this isn't fair to ask of a child, um, they should they should turn to trusted adults um, to let them know when they're scared or they need something. The adults around them might not have accepted what's going on yet, so so that can be a problem. It's really hard to know where to turn, and there are people who are going to explo exploit children who are vulnerable. So it's a really tricky position to be in. And I'll speak in code because we have one little snuggly boogly right there. But um, yeah, but I would say it's like help them find their superpower. You know, what is that? Is it music? Is it athletics? Is it writing? Is it art? Find some place that they can have an outlet to put all these really confusing feelings. Um, that's what the child can themselves do is, is find a place in some other, a tr trusted other who they can sort of tell the truth to and just have fun with. Just have some unfettered joy every once in a while. To parents, I would say, um, me personally, I would name it. I would say, you know what? Daddy isn't daddy right now. He's having a hard time. And I'm, you know what? If daddy starts to, to behave in a way that is, is scary to you, you're going to tell me and I'm going to take care of it. Or you have the right to go to your room and shut the door. Um, as my daughter, who's now 19, once told me, she said, she goes, mom, here's the boundary. Here's you. Here, right here. Here's the boundary. Here's you. And I feel like if I'm going to write my book about CTE, it would be called Here's the Boundary, Here's You. <laughs> you know, and um, and just really teach kids about boundaries and what they get to do, um, what they're allowed to do with the people in their lives when they say no and that it's a complete sentence. So I get that's the super quick 30 second version of it that took me 11 years of therapy to figure out. So um <laughs> yeah no, no no that's a great answer and and, and I, i'm not worried about going over there is no such thing as over in this <laughs> because we're yeah. going to show this widely um it's samantha um same uh, question to you well i hate to follow that because i think rebecca said it all i i think what what i would add is to you know the adult child or at least the older child um that again and i just go back to the importance of connecting get get involved uh, talk to other people, talk to people who really understand what's going on. Um, most of all, try to understand this is not you. Your, your, your dad's sick. It's not your dad. It's not your family member, your mom in this case at this point. You know, we have athletes, uh, women, men. Um, th this is not your fault. I just think it's so easy as a child to internalize. You know, we don't, as children, we don't have the benefit of being a peer to our spouse as they change we are experiencing the change and we are experiencing it as someone who hasn't quite grown into the person who it, things just don't happen to. And so I just, I, I think that's really hard. And we just, you know, I, I just can't stress enough how it, it's, this isn't your dad, he's, or your mom, they're not well. And most of all, this isn't your fault. Um, to parents, the same thing, to, to spouses, parents of those, uh, to kids of uh, victims of brain injury and, and CTE, uh, you know, the same. Um, but the biggest message I wanna give to parents is don't let your kids play football before they're 14, uh, you know, and, and, and protect your kids' brains. I, 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 I can't stress that enough. Um, I'm actually, I have to say, going back to the beginning with Rebecca and all of the wives that I have, you know, grown to be such good friends with, I'm actually horrified to see how many people are on this group, how quickly our group, so to speak, is growing and, uh, and how lucky I was to at least have my dad as long as I had him. It, it everybody, you know, people are losing their loved ones much sooner now. And I, I just, I'm horrified and I feel so lucky. And I just want everyone to hang on to that. Well said. And, and um, you brought up a good point, uh, flag football under 14. You know, Rebecca, did you direct an award-winning PSA 
about that? Hmm, yes, I think we were part of that team. <laughs> you want to talk about this PSA you directed and sure. you won and how you feel about it? Yeah, I that I did. Team the team CLF and Angela Harrison and the people at Finger Paint Marketing came up with this amazing um, idea to try to to merge in people's minds smoking and and tackling and that you don't want your 10 year old to smoke a cigarette because of long term potential damage you don't want your kid to bang their head because of the potential that's almost a direct quote of Chris Nowinski. Um, and Angela um, her dad had played college football not pro football but had had the same disease and and we had become friends and just talking about her experiences she had this brainstorm she went to. I don't know if she called you first or she called me first, but at the beginning it was like, okay, let's do this. Like, we think we can find $10,000 and like go out and guerrilla style and like shoot this thing. And, um, and so we kind of brainstormed about it. And I, then I think she went to you and then suddenly it became like really real and, and, um, and it's beautiful. And I think when we have over a billion media impressions, one uh one at least three cleos and it won like another 10 major uh awards so yeah it's 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 a really powerful campaign i'm, I'm really um grateful to have been a part of that so and and, and it's lucky that i was already a director because then i didn't actually have to like totally learn something new to contribute <laughs> uh, to the next level so yeah no we appreciate you putting your your artistic talent to the uh, to the game here so uh, all right so we're getting six o'clock i know you have things to do so why don't i let I'll, I'll i have a little wrap up but why don't i why don't we get your your final thoughts and advice i mean what yeah, this is gold what you guys have said and i we're gonna I think, share the transcript as a it's a book chapter because it, you guys are writing the book writing the book on this thing but what, what do you want people to know before they they go back to their lives and have to deal with this in their lives well, Sam, you want to go first? You want to go? Yeah, absolutely. Um, because my biggest message that I want to spread and, and yell at the top of you know the rooftops is connect, reach out and connect, find somebody, uh, get get a hold of Concussion Legacy Foundation, uh, ask for a peer call, start getting to know people who are going through what you're doing. I mean, I'm, I'm hoping I, I've been very honored to be part of uh, you know the or, making peer calls. And I'm also hoping that we can branch out and start some peer groups and meet on Zoom and meet geographically in different areas. And I just want everyone to know that they are not alone. And there are so many people that get you and get this disease. And it is different as Rebecca touched on, it's different than Alzheimer's, it's different than other neurodegenerative diseases. And we need to come together in this huge, I, I was at the huddle and uh, someone wonderfully said, we are a part of this club. And quite frankly, it's a crappy club, but we're here and we're in it together. And I, I just want everyone to know that you have someone that you can turn to and who gets it. Yeah, I would say um, the initiation rates for joining the club are crappy, but the club is awesome. <laughs> That's what I would say, um, not to, but uh, I think that um, the, the one thing that I would say, which I agree with Sam, that connection and not isolating yourself and trying to provide as many, um, like um, um, they were saying earlier, connecting your, your loved one and trying to mediate some of those social interactions is really important. But also um, this is gonna sound really silly, but try it is um, the way our brains are structured, you can't be, in fear or even anger and curiosity at the same time. You can't, you can't be in both of those places in your brain at the same time. So when, when you have a moment where you feel overwhelmed by rage, go for it, have the rage, or you feel overwhelmed by fear or grief, go for it. all the, all the feelings are, are, are available to us in the palate. And, and that's a good thing. But if you feel like you're stuck there too long, try to replace it with curiosity about anything about anything to get you out of that because those grooves can become dug so deep in you that it is really hard to get out and you just you cannot be in curiosity and any of those other negative feelings at the same time so just consider trying it out um especially as you reach out to find that person too will give you that secret handshake so well said thank you both so much for coming and sharing your experience your story uh obviously the audience appreciates it so much from all the comments in the chat and we're watching so just thank you i know you've been through a lot and thank you for sharing your hard-earned wisdom with us 
Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you. All Good right, to see you, Sam. Continuing to work with you both. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And it's so good again to see so many of our friends in the chat. I see Sylvia Mackey's been making comments, a member of our board of directors. So thank you, Sylvia, for coming out to Vegas over the weekend with all the other legacy families, Sarah Naylor, so many, so many great friends. Um, and, and, and just about all of them I know have also shared their story on the Concussion uh, Legacy Foundation website with our legacy stories. So we'll throw that link up at the chat if you want to learn about all the others who have shared their story. Um, Elizabeth Allardyce, so all of you, thank you guys for teaching us what to do. And we're now working with a number of scientists to try to codify what we're learning and share more advice uh, for, more, for more families. Do you mind if I give this closing speech right now real quick? Thank you. All right, so I want to thank you, all of our guests, Dr. Olasco, Rebecca, Sam, Barbara, and Becky for joining us. If you or a loved one is currently struggling with symptoms of suspected CTE, we are here for you. Please reach out to the CLF helpline today, the URL on the screen in the chat. Provides personalized help for those struggling with concussions, PCS, or suspected CTE symptoms by providing treatment recommendations and peer support. It's important to know you're not alone and help is available and that help works. We appreciate you all tuning in. I hope you're leaving, learning something new, feeling supported. Remember this, this month, CLF, along with our partners in CLF Canada and our new partners in CLF UK are celebrating International CT Awareness Month. This is a great chance to get more involved. One way to do that is to sign up to participate in clinical research. We'll continue to announce studies all month long. So sign up for the clinical research registry at pledgemybrain.org. Uh, you don't have to pledge your brand. You can just take part in clinical research. The link is in the chat. And the foundation is able to put on events like this for free through your support. If you found this helpful, you want to pay it forward, making your first donation to CLF of any amount helps us continue to create more resources for this community. We're adding a donate link to the chat right now. We are wishing you and your families continued safety and health. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and Kenzie, do you want to say goodbye to everybody? Bye. Bye, everybody. Thanks, and take care. Bye, Chris. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Rebecca. Thank you. This was great. Thank, Thank you, you so much for including me. Yeah. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Barbara.